You're listening to the Men's Dating Mastery Podcast with host Alec Chase, bringing you the experts in dating, sex, and relationships. Hey guys, welcome back to MDM. Today I'm speaking with Jason Comley about overcoming fear of rejection. After some major life changes, including a divorce, Jason developed a severe case of social anxiety, which was rooted in his fear of rejection. Unwilling to accept this new reality though, Jason came up with a game called rejection therapy, which he used to effectively overcome his anxiety. The game is very simple. It has only one rule and that is to get rejected by at least one person every single day. And it comes with cards that provide suggestions on things you can ask of people in order to get that rejection. Since its invention, the rejection therapy has become a hit with people all over the world and Jason has become an international phenomenon who continues to appear in all sorts of media and to receive invitations to speak to audiences around the world. In this episode, Jason and I talk about his story of overcoming his social anxiety and the lessons learned along the way. We talk about how not getting enough human interaction can lead you to develop social inhibitions. We talk about people's relationship with their comfort zone and how to push up against it. And Jason shares a really cool formula for fear, along with some practical advice on how to tackle it. This episode is actually pretty unique in that it not only has a direct application to your dating life, but it is equally relevant, well, to all facets of your life. Jason is a super nice guy, and I hope you enjoy this interview. And if you do, then please subscribe, leave a five-star rating, and a positive review in iTunes or in whatever your favorite podcast directory is. That's enough for me. Now, on to the interview. Hi, Jason. Thank you for joining me today. It's great being here. Uh, so to get us started, how about we get your backstory? What was your life like before you began rejection therapy? Well, I had basically begun a new life. This is after my divorce and I was starting up a business, my own business, uh, doing website design and, and that sort of stuff, IT kind of stuff. And I got this really great client and he was kind of a super connector too. So he was really happy with my stuff and he was, uh, spreading the word uh you know i know this guy he's he's really great if you need a website or whatever and he was keeping me really busy and so here i was i was you know diligently trying to meet these deadlines and uh working really hard and i kind of sequestered myself uh into my one bedroom apartment there and uh just working all the time i really kind of isolated myself from any kind of from society essentially except um, maybe meeting up with clients or whatever so uh, and I think that's where it really kind of started was um, not getting out and I found that that isolation was creating anxiety problems like I would try try and go out and just meet someone uh, on some free time and I just didn't know how. It was just like, how do I just approach a stranger and start talking? It was just very, very uncomfortable. Like even at the gym, I would, or something, I would just be I'd kind of break out in a cold sweat, you know, just trying to make small conversation with somebody. And I thought, well, this is a real problem here. But the thing was, is that, you know, when I grew up, I was told that oh, you know, uh, make sure you're not out of your comfort zone or, you know, if you feel like you're out of your comfort zone, just let me know and all this kind of stuff. Like, you know, your comfort zone is where you must be to, to be happy kind of thing. And I just, for me, I was realizing, no, you know, this is, I when I'm trying to get out of my comfort zone, I'm trying to meet other people, but it's just agonizing and I, I just didn't know what to do about it. So... That's that's kind of where I was. I was really antisocial um, and and just working, just trying to make this business run. But uh, uh, I didn't really have a support network, or I wasn't really socializing. And and I think that's you know. And I was I was never really that social to begin with. Very kind of nerdy in a way. Right. I I can actually relate to that in a big way. I spent most of my career in finance and. I think the similarity or the parallels between uh, working in technology or in finance is that you tend to spend a lot of time alone in front of a computer. 
Right. And, you know, the less you interact with people, the less you socialize, the more difficult that becomes. So Absolutely. I can, I can certainly relate. So what was the switch for you? When did you say, okay, this is enough, I need to do something? Well, I, you know, I remember, you know, meeting up with this client and I was having this panic attack just waiting for this this prospective client to show up and you know and then I met him and I'm trying to stay cool and I'm just my mind is racing and I'm just thinking too much and I'm way too self-conscious and then uh, we start making you know small uh, conversation or whatever and I'm not really paying attention to what he says. I'm like trying to follow my breathing and just stay calm. And I'm just thinking, you know what? I can't live like this. Um, this, you know, I I can't even be around people. This is this is bad. So, uh, and and just trying to ask someone for directions. It was I was becoming outright um, neurotic or something. It was just my my social anxiety was definitely. Um, getting out of control and so i remember i was in front of the computer as i normally was um working quote unquote but really just hiding away where i was comfortable again in my comfort zone again uh where i was always retreating and i just um i just remember i was staring at the computer screen but thinking deep in thought and I w i'd often get angry too like i would go out i would try and meet someone i would try and get out of my comfort zone i couldn't it was just um it was really really hard and i would get angry and i was like this isn't fair you know why um why why is this happening to me you know other people are have an easy time, you know, talking with other people. How come I, I'm having such a hard time? So anyway, I was just, um, kind of feeling angry and sorry for myself. And, but then I realized, you know what? I'm afraid of rejection. And it was, you know, at the time, it was just such a bombshell that went off. It was like afraid of rejection. Well, you know, for, somehow I was just, I was in, denial for so long you know like oh i don't really care about what people think about me i don't really you know i had some i had this kind of um i don't know uh i was buying into another story about myself um and uh, but i realized you know what you're afraid of rejection and uh, and so i thought okay well what do i do about it and I thought, well, there's really only two things I can do about it. And one would be to try and avoid uh, rejection. And I've been doing that, and that doesn't seem to be helping. And um, Or I can face it head on. And I was thinking, you know, when I thought, oh, I'm afraid of rejection, it was like, well, that's, I don't know, like, I mean, that's not really tough. You know, like, I mean, I, I just sort of thought like I had been researching the Spetsnaz. Um, they're like a Russian elite military force. They're, they're kind of like, um, us Navy seals, except with the Spetsnaz, um, you can't apply, uh, for that. Um, they, they will, uh, sort of invite you if you're, you know, if they can see some real special talents, um, and, um, and, you know, qualities uh, about, about you that they can, they may in, invite you, but, uh, but it's very, very hardcore training. And I thought, you know, I, I, I need to be, I need to attack this problem. Like, like they do, you know, like they attack problems and just go right at it. And that's what I kind of did. They were, they were my inspiration really. And I just sort of thought, well, you know, looking at their training, they did a lot of, um, what I, what I called at the time forced exposure. So a lot of really harmful situations, uh, they were being exposed to, they were being locked in very small quarters. Uh, they were being tortured. Um, 
all just to sort of condition them and toughen them up and everything else. And I thought, well, that's what I'm going to do with this problem with rejection is that I'm going to go out and I'm going to get rejected. And so right then and there on the spot, I made myself a challenge. I said, I'm going to get myself rejected every single day. And it's like, I'm not going to try and get myself rejected. You know, that's just a loophole, you know, like I have to get rejected. And I, you know, and if I, if, I make a request and they give it to me. I have to go out and get, try again until I get rejected. Nothing else is going to matter. And I need to uh, do that every single day. And so it was like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. So that was sort of the, the start of it. It was just, it just turned out to be a, a challenge to myself. And the, the interesting thing that I've learned about uh, rejection therapy, it's actually rooted in a psychotherapeutic technique called flooding. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I didn't know that at the time, though. Uh, at the time, I was going based on Spetsna uh, training, and I don't normally read Reddit, but somehow I found out that there was a psychologist that had basically said, you know, I am a psychologist, I'll answer all your questions kind of thing, right? And I went, whoa, okay, uh, I need to ask the psychologist this question. So... I'm not even sure what I, how I phrased the question, but it was just something like, you know, is there a certain, you know, tech, psychological technique being used where people are exposed to their fear, you know, that sort of thing? And, and she said, yeah, it's, you know, it's called flooding. And I'm just like, oh, okay. And I, I think she linked to um, the Wikipedia um, article too. And so it was like, aha. Yeah, and I actually read that very uh, same Wikipedia article, and just for the sake of the audience, the way it's described is that the psychotherapeutic technique called flooding, it's based in the principle that if we expose ourselves to the thing that we are afraid of, particularly if that fear is irrational and our reaction to it is disproportionate to the actual threat of whatever it is that we're afraid of, then we'll, with exposure and with time, we'll become immune to it. Yeah. And so that's what was basically uh, happening. You know, the thing is, though, is that in doing rejection therapy, I discovered a lot more. There was certainly a lot more benefits to it. And uh, the kind of perception shift, you know, the, the kind of reframing that it did on my life was so huge and uh, and how it just kind of redefined rejection for me but that was certainly the the core intent so actually can you talk about that once you've started going out and actively seeking rejection what did you start to experience well you know like right away when i had resolved to go and get rejected immediately it was a huge shift in reality it was like i can ask for anything i want now nothing can stop me now from getting what i want and asking for what i want you know like it was just i had just been stopping myself it was all this kind of self-talk and all these kind of stories i was telling myself and all these fictional outcomes I was creating in my mind preventing me from even making most requests at all. So I just, just that alone thinking, you know what, I can ask for anything I want. I wonder what the limit is. I remember uh, seeing a tweet and it was a guy, he said, started playing rejection therapy. I feel great. Who wants to rule the world with me? You know, that was the tweet. And it was just like, that's exactly how I felt. It's like, who wants to rule the world with me? It was like all these new possibilities. And then, it, you know, it was a process too. So it was kind of, um, where do I start? You know, so I started small, as small as I could. And so, uh, you know, my first rejection was asking um, this attractive woman uh, for uh, directions. And um, but she, she just kind of, rolled her eyes a little bit like oh brother you know and so i kind of got blown off she didn't she didn't know uh you know where it was i was and just sort of uh dismissed me a little bit but it was but then i was like yes you know i mean it was so hard to go up to her and i could feel you know the sweat pouring off my face and my chest was starting to pound and um my um, mouth was going all dry and uh, just, you know, just going up to ask for directions, you know, uh, 
And, uh, but then after I got the rejection, I'm like, yes. And I'm thinking like, whoa, that's weird. You know, <laughs> like I'm pumping my fist because I got rejected. This is amazing. Like it was just a complete reframing. So one of the implied stipulations, actually almost everything is implicit with, with rejection therapy is, you know, you should be asking for things that you want, uh, because you may just get it, you know, so be careful about what you're asking for. You may just get it. And, and, uh, you know, just being, um, thoughtful of, of people and respectful of people. I mean, again, that's, uh, that, that's, that's implied. That's implicit. I, um, I would expect that that would sort of be common knowledge, but, um, I, I'm not really sure where I was going. I, I think you just made two important points. Okay. You know, one of them being is it sounds like there are two benefits of playing this game, and one is essentially the liberation that you experience by freeing yourself from inhibitions. But the second one you mentioned is you might actually get yeses. You know, there's a saying that you don't get what you don't ask for. So by going out and seeking rejection, you might actually be surprised and and get what you want. And that's what I'm hearing. But the second point that uh, I, I was actually going to come to this anyway, so I'm gr- glad you brought this up. There's still probably a certain element of courtesy that you would need to exercise if you were to play this game. So for instance, you know, one of the thoughts that came to my mind when I was thinking about this is that, well, what if I started playing this game within my immediate social circle? Probably want to make sure I don't want to push the envelope too much and, uh, you know, and risk alienating my friends in the process. So I think you already touched on this, but if you can comment on that a little bit more. Absolutely. You know, a lot of the suggestions, you know, it's best used on strangers kind of thing, right? So, uh, but, but again, yeah, I mean, a lot of this is sort of implicit being a decent person and respecting the other person, having empathy for the other person. And that's one thing with playing uh, rejection therapy. One thing that this is just, again, anyone listening you have to play it to really understand um, and to catch it all. But, you know, the one thing that uh, that I get is sort of like there's a heightened sense of reality. You know, like, uh, you know, you're going into a bookstore or something like that. You're, you're looking for a rejection and your senses are heightened. You, there's just a sense of being alive and uh, everything has more pop to it you know just colors are crisper and sounds are and it's just like yeah this is what it's like to be alive you know um you know it was elber uh, elber camus had said um live on the verge of tears you know it's sort of like that you know i think he, he had meant that you know when you live on the verge of tears you know live on the verge of tears of joy tears of frustration tears of um sadness tears of exhaustion tears of you know just live on the verge of tears right and it just feels like that uh playing rejection therapy you are on the verge of something um something bigger and and i really think that we just kind of need to live that way we need to live bigger uh bigger than we are but you know sort of going full circle back to uh, what you were saying is, you know, being a decent person, it's all kind of implied. I designed the game to be very, very simple. So that simplicity uh, allows for a lot more depth. So I've heard you mention a formula for fear that you came up with as a result of playing this game. Can you tell us a little bit about that one? I think that was really cool. Yeah, that was just sort of a formula that I had kind of discovered. The, you know, I I absolutely do not endorse um, the uh, the pickup community. Okay, so but they do have a system where it's like th- they call it the three second rule. So you you have to act within three seconds, and I I think that's that's a sound rule um, is to not allow too much time between um, you and doing what you want to do. And so, you know, then there's a thinking part of it, too. Uh, And, you know, the more time you wait, the more likely you are to think. And of course, you know, when we're thinking, we are uh, forecasting what may happen or we're, you know, telling ourselves stories or something like that. And thought 
creates a lot of suffering, right? So uh, if you can remove one or the other, if you can stay, if you can stay perfectly present um, for long periods of time, then you won't experience fear. Or if you can act quickly, even if you're nervous, uh, that's great too. But both of them together, the fear can be really crippling. Yeah. So to summarize, it's the formula is time plus thinking equals fear. And as long as you can take away time or thinking, then you can't have fear. Yeah. So basically, if you're someone who meditates a lot, and I don't meditate enough, but you know, if you can sort of maintain a state of um, uh, equanimity, you know, then you you're sort of in a sustained kind of Zen mode, and then time really isn't isn't a factor. You're you're not really thinking. You're not a, attached to your thoughts. You're not sort of contained within your own mind. And so that can be pretty powerful. So you went down this journey and clearly, you know, achieved a lot of personal growth. How's your life now compared to what it used to be, you know, specifically with respect to, you know, fear of rejections or feeling of social anxiety? Are you completely free of inhibitions or do you still need to work at it to maintain that? I'll call it the kind of a sense of freedom. Yeah. Well, okay. So when it comes to social anxieties, I, you know, I think I just blew that away. I've just have not had any, you know, I haven't had any panic attacks or anything like that. Um, like it's just gone. Um, another thing that I noticed too, is that I used to, you know, before rejection therapy, my default was to not do it or to not try or to not do this or that or or to not ask. Now my default is to ask, is to do it, is to take a chance. So in a sense, I kind of just rewired my mind in that in that sense. I rewired my behavior, uh, and and that's uh, pretty remarkable. You know, the one thing I one really important thing that I did learn too is that the uh your comfort zone is like an elastic band actually like with an elastic band you can stretch it out and as you push it out it gets bigger and bigger but the elastic band will also retract um if if you allow it if you're not pushing against it but not back to its original size it'll still be a little bit bigger than it was it won't go right back to and that's what i noticed too that there were periods of time especially um, in these canadian winters sometimes i'll be in my apartment for three or four days or if i get caught up in a project or something like that and i um and then my sort of uh, uh introverted personality takes over and i i end up not uh getting out and um being social like i should um i do notice that when i go back outside and start interacting that there's a little bit of an adjustment there. It's like, whoa, you know, um, oh, I got to talk to human beings again. Okay. You know, this, but having that experience of going through all those things and working through it, see, it's a process, right? So the one thing about, um, rejection therapy is that, uh, you know, you're starting small, you're not trying to slay the dragon or, you know, try, a uh, uh, asking out, uh, you know, this beautiful woman, uh, if that's your greatest fear or whatever. I mean, you want to start small and then work your way up. And then, you know, and and so it's amazing. You know, you in playing the game, you really get a sense of what your range is, what your comfort zone is, and you really see other people in their comfort zones and how people guard their comfort zones. So obvious. It's just like wow. Um, I don't know. I just pick up body language and that kind of stuff just so much better when I'm kind of in that heightened state. Um, and I'm I'm in a heightened state, but I'm also in an, in an extremely vulnerable state, like a purposely vulnerable state. It's very, very freeing. You just have to drop the ego and drop all the, any kind of pretense that you have and just allow yourself to be vulnerable and interact with people and and other people will see that they'll see that in your body language and and that's what i notice too it's like my shoulders there's something that my shoulders loosen up and and i i physically kind of open up more and just people will read that and they open up more too so it's it's amazing it's how people react differently when i'm playing rejection therapy it's so it's it's a great kind of psychological social experiment and you you can learn a lot about yourself 
and your stages of fear and anxiety and how you start to notice your own symptoms um, and how they kind of ratchet up and how you can overcome them and everything else. And it's once it's changed my life so much. I like I, you know, I've been invited different countries around the world to speak in front of big audiences of it's amazing. That's really powerful stuff. I mean, it sounds like a real transformational journey. It was interesting. I was listening to speak and I heard you talk about being more vulnerable. Uh, me and my girlfriend, we always talk about how we challenge one another to be better, kind of better version of ourselves. And the one thing she does for me, and she always reminds me of it is, you know, teaching me how to be more vulnerable and, you know, having, I guess, the strength to show that. Uh, so that, that really resonated with me. I know I've held you a little bit longer than I've asked you for. So I just want to wrap up with a final question. A lot of the guys listening to this, they're suffering from approach anxiety, which essentially means they're afraid to approach them to even begin an interaction with them, let alone anything that might follow next. So based on your own journey and your own experience, is there, you know, a tangible, you know, really, really simple piece of advice that you can give these guys that they can start to apply today in order to get over their anxiety. Oh, yeah. And they can start right away with this, too. And that is to stop telling yourself stories. Stop telling yourself stories. Um, that means excuses. That means, you know, whether it's factual or uh, fictional or, you know, just uh, wondering or any kind of adjective that you can you know, or synonym that you can uh, find in the th thesaurus, stop it, stop it, stop thinking, um, stop telling yourself stories. So, you know, we, we're always telling ourselves stories uh, and we have this kind of narrative about ourselves and who we think we are and who we think our struggles are. And, and if we just stop that and anytime you, uh, and I'm saying you, me, everybody, when we can catch ourselves in a story, that we're telling ourselves just to stop it, just stop it cold right there. And if you get rejected, don't tell yourself any stories, move on, you know? Um, and you know, the thing is, is that we know so little about anything, uh, why that person said, no, who knows why we, we just, we just can't see everything, but we sometimes will uh, come up with these excuses or stories or or whatever as to what we think it might be. And we just need to stop that. Thank you so much for that advice. If guys wanted to get in touch with you to learn more about uh, rejection therapy or get the game, uh, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, well, rejectiontherapy.com. And uh, yeah, they can sort of contact me through that. My email's there and uh, Twitter, uh, account is is there so yeah they can reach out to me and uh happy to help uh, any way i can so um and thank you thank you for uh, having me on and for uh for hearing me out thanks so much i uh, i really appreciate the conversation you surprised me with uh, a few nuggets that i didn't see coming so thanks a lot for that and it's uh, been a pleasure having you on thank you i hope you like that conversation guys if you have any comments questions or suggestions for the show if you'd like to recommend a guest or even if you just want to drop me a note you can email me directly at alec at mensdatingmastery.com that's alec with a c i love to hear from you and i reply to every single email personally if you enjoyed the show then please take a moment to subscribe and leave a five-star rating along with a positive review in itunes or in whatever your favorite podcast directory is that will go a long way to keeping this show going and help me attract the best guests so that I can continue to bring you value. Also, don't forget to check out mensdatingmastery.com where you will find all the episodes to this podcast, my blog, and where you can subscribe to the newsletter to keep abreast of the latest content from MDM. And just for the record, I don't spam and I don't share your email with anyone. If you do get an email from me, it's because I have some great new content that I want to share with you and that you would not want to miss. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to Men's Dating Mastery, a podcast dedicated to improving the lives of men and the women around them.